morning and thanks to everyone for joining us today. I, Ankit Dogra, along with my teammates, Dr. Deepika Chhabra and Mr. Amit Saxena from Medical Services, Jackson Pal Pharmaceuticals Limited, are very pleased to welcome you all to the program today by Delhi PG Forum of AOGD with cases being presented by postgraduate medical students of ESI PGIM SR Basai Darapur, Delhi with academic partner, Jackson Pal Pharmaceuticals Limited makers of lycorid prex sashes containing L-arginine, lycopene, and DHA to prevent pregnancy complications. Injection maintain 250 and 500 mg depot progesterone containing 17 alpha hydroxy progesterone caproate and endorate tablets of Dynogest 2 mg for the medical management of endometriosis and endometriosis associated pelvic pain. Dear attendees, if you have any suggestions, questions, or clarifications, please post them in the Q&A box. Please note this class of PG Forum is being streamed on live on Facebook. The link has been shared in the chat box. To refer to this webinar in future, please visit our YouTube channel, Jackson Pal Medical Insights. We express our sincere appreciation to the AOGD office peers and the coordinators of Delhi PG Forum for taking Jackson Pal Pharmaceuticals Limited as the academic partner for the monthly programs of Delhi PG Forum. Thank you so much for listening. And now let us welcome Dr. Sunita Malik, PG Forum coordinator, to kindly initiate the program. Over to you, ma'am. Welcome to today's uh, session on recurrent pregnancy law. That's a very important topic and going to come in any of uh, the, you know, every exam, this is going to be given to the students. And so be careful and listen to the presentations, uh, which is very important for uh, today's session. And uh, for this, I, the chairperson for today's session is Dr. Sangeeta Gupta. She is consultant and ex-HOD of um, ESI PGI uh, Medical Sciences and Research, Nisai Darapur, founder secretary of Delhi Gynecologist Forum, member of Safe Food Mother Committee, Foxy Faculty for Maternal Mortality Workshops, and many other uh, programs of Government of India, competent trainer. She has uh, done uh, uh, her WHO fellowship in gynae oncology and uh, also uh, has done training on uh, ART from AIMS. And uh, she is a recognized teacher and has many publications in international and national journals of repute. Uh, the moderators of today's uh, session are Dr. Taru Gupta. She's current HOD of ESI PGI MSR Visayi Darapur. She's uh, been professor for more than 24 years of uh, experience, has keen interest in management of high-risk pregnancy, advanced endoscopic surgery and gynae oncology. She's also a trainer of uh, MEOC and awarded many awards by Foxy, ICOG, member of AOGD, NACHI, DGS and Foxy, has numerous publications in the index journals, has also received best paper award in senior category in 2020. Uh, the other moderator for today is Dr. Kavita Agarwal. She is associate professor in VMMC in Sabdajang Hospital. She's at present chairperson of infertility subcommittee of AOGD, vice president of IMA South Delhi branch. And just recently, yesterday only, she won another election of IMA CGP assistant secretary for next year. She's national corresponding editor of Joggy and organizing joint secretary of Foxy BOH conference. She's winner of many awards and has got very good posters and paper presentations. And uh, she's got many uh, research publications also and is a uh, guest faculty of more than 100 conferences. So uh, before we hand over to the host, uh, I would like Dr. Achala Batra, AOGD president, to say a few words. Thank you, Sunita. I'm really happy with the progress of our PG forum. And uh, I am uh, sure it is the tradition is going to continue because the PGs are liking it and you people can just carry it on. Though next month the AOGD will go to Mulana Zat, but you people will remain the coordinators and you can carry the program from forward. And uh, uh, we're having a lot of 
nice comments about the program from all the PGs and they're really appreciating the programs and the hard work which is being put in by the coordinators as well as the students and with very good inputs. So I'm thankful to Jackson Pal also that uh, they will, uh, and I'm sure they will continue the program next year also. Uh, and uh, happy learning to all of you. I would like Dr. Sangeeta Gupta to say a few words with, as a chairperson of today's meet, uh, class. Thank you, Dr. Ashla and Dr. Sunita. Uh, thanks a lot for making ESI Basai Darapur a part of this PG Forum sessions. Uh, we all know that recurrent pregnancy loss is a heterogeneous condition with numerous causes and numerous treatment modalities. It is a multidisciplinary problem involving gynecology, immunology, genetics, endocrinology, internal medicine, and even pediatrics. Whatever the causes and treatment options available, the psychological impl implication of this problem is enormous. The anxiety is multiplied when the diagnosis remains unexplained. So at this level, we all have to know the um, guidelines telling us about the evalu uh, evaluation and treatment of recurrent pregnancy loss, leaving behind the controversy. Uh, previously, I think it was said that the disease is often of infertility, but with the recent advances in immunology, genetics, and after knowing the mechanism of thrombosis, we are doing much bet better in the field. And I hope at the end of the discussion, all of us will be more aware about the evaluation as well as um, the treatment of recurrent pregnancy lo loss. However, we may not be able to answer certain questions which are left as such because the disease is very vast and very controversial. So over to Dr. Taru Gupta. Good evening all. So at the outset, uh, I would like to thank Dr. Ashla Batra, ma'am, President AOGD, Dr. Sunita Malik, madam, and Dr. Shivani Agarwal, madam, PG coordinators for this uh, PG forum for the wonderful initiative of teaching and updating the students. And in fact, the students, they experience the mock drill of the examination, practical examination. So after Dr. Sanita Gupta, Madam's brief introduction about the today's topic, I would request uh, and I would uh, invite our first speaker, Dr. Sunaira Agarwal. She will be discussing uh, case one and Dr. Nitika, she will be discussing the other case of recurrent pregnancy loss. And myself and Dr. Kavita Agarwal will be moderating the session. Uh, Dr. Kavita, I request you to moderate first case and I'll be moderating the second case primarily. So Dr. Sunaina, please share your screen. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Sunaina Agarwal, uh, postgraduate resident of ESI Hospital, and I'll be presenting my case uh, today on recurrent pregnancy loss. My patient is Mrs. Bai, a 26 years old female, resident of Nazavgar, a housewife, educated up to class 12th, married to Mrs. Mr. T, belonging to lower middle class, by modified Kupuswami scale, she's gravida three, abortion two, at 14 weeks gestational gestation, presented first time in ANC OPD of our hospital after being referred from dispensary for routine follow-up. My patient is in her first trimester. She conceived spontaneously and confirmed pregnancy by UPT done at home after two weeks of her missed periods. Her dating scan was done at seven weeks of pregnancy from a private practitioner. She's regularly taking her folic acid tablets. There's no history of excessive nausea or vomiting. There's no history of drug intake or radiation exposure. There's no history of fever with or without rashes and no history of burning micturition. She, uh, her OBS history is as follow. She's married for two and a half years in a non-consanguineous marriage and gives history of two consecutive unprovoked sudden pregnancy losses. Her abortion one was conceived spontaneously in December, 2019. Cardiac activity was documented by ultrasound and blood investigations done were normal as per patient's history, but no documents were available for the same. She gave a history of vague lower back pain associated with leaking, which was followed by abortion of a grossly normal fetus expelled at home at five months of amenorrhea in presence of a dye. No curatage was done for this pregnancy. There was no previous history of small, foul smelling discharge, fever, pain lower abdomen, abdominal trauma, 
intercourse or any drug intake prior to abortion. Post-abortive phase was uneventful and no further follow-up or investigations were done for this pregnancy. Her abortion too was conceived spontaneously in January 2021. Pregnancy was confirmed with urine pregnancy test done at home after two weeks of missed period. Blood, blood investigations were done at Anganwari, which were normal. Cardiac activity was documented by ultrasound, but no documents were available for this pregnancy as well. She gave a history of excessive watery discharge at four and a half months of amenorrhea, for which she consulted at local primary health center. It was followed by painless expulsion of a fetus within one hour of watery discharge. There was no previous history of foul smelling discharge, fever, pain lower abdomen, abdominal trauma, intercourse, or drug intake. No curatage was done for this pregnancy as well. She was advised a course of antibiotics for one week and some investigation, which she did not get done due to COVID lockdown. My patient had her last menstrual period at 14th November, 2021, which makes her expected date of delivery to be 21 August, 2022. She was 14 weeks on the day of examination. She has the regular monthly menses with no associated dysmenorrhea or passage of clots. Uh, in her past history, there is no history of diabetes, hypertension, renal diseases, autoimmune disease, epilepsy, thyroid disorder in the past, or venous or arterial thromb uh, thromboembolism. There's no history of cervical interventions in the past and no history of any other chronic medical or surgical illness. She has a normal sleep wake and bowel bladder cycle, no history of coffee, beer, alcohol, recreational drug intake, or any other addictions. There is no history of any known allergies. She consumes a mixed diet and by 24 hour recall method, the calorie intake is nearly 2000 kilocalories with calorie deficit of 500 kilocalories and 60 gram proteins, which is adequate as per her requirement. Her husband is 30 years of age, a government employee, non-smoker, non-alcoholic, with no history of tobacco chewing. There's no history of any chronic medical or surgical illness in the past. His BMI is 21 kg per meter square. There's no significant family history of any chronic medical or surgical illness. There's no similar history of recurrent pregnancy loss, congenital malformation or stillbirths in the family. There's no, uh, she's not on any regular medications. On a general physical examination was done in a well-lit room after taking verbal consent from the patient. My patient was alert, conscious and cooperative. Her uh, BMI was 21.8 kg per meter square. She was afebrile to touch. Hydration was adequate. Her pulse rate was 88 beats per minute, which was regular, good volume with no radio radial or radio femoral delay. Her blood pressure was 118 by 77, uh, 76 uh, millimeters of mercury in right arm and sitting position. Her respiratory rate was 14 breaths per minute with no pallor, cyanosis, clubbing, icterus, or edema. There was no associated enlarged neck glands or no engorged neck veins. Breast, shows, uh, breast showed normal changes of pregnancy. On systemic examination, respirate, uh, bilateral uh, air entry was present in chest equal on both sides with no added sounds. S1 and S2 was audible and no murmur was present. Uh, CNX examination was within normal limits. On uh, per abdominal examination, on inspection, abdomen was flat, umbilicus inverted and central. No dilated veins, sinus or scar marks were seen. All quadrants were moving equally with respiration. Hernial sites were free on cuff impulse. On palpation, Abdomen was afebrile to touch and non-tender. Uterus equivalent to 14 weeks gravid size was palpable. There was no organomegaly. On gynecological examination, external genitalia appeared normal on local examination. On perp speculum examination, there were no cervical or vaginal discharge or bleeding seen. Cervix was long, tubular, and nearly three to 3.5 centimeter in length. On per vaginal examination, uterus was antiverted soft, nearly 12 to 14 weeks in size, mobile, non-tender. Cervix was firm and posterior, bilateral furnaces were free and non-tender. These were the following investigations that she was advised in an antenatal period, and uh, all these investigations were normal. 
Uh, this is the ultrasound of the patient, uh, which was done at seven weeks of her missed uh, period, which showed a single life intrauterine fetus of six weeks and six days. CRL was co corresponding and cardiac, activities, a cardiac activity was present. Uh, so my provi uh, provisional diagnosis is of uh, is 26 year old uh, gra uh, gravida three abortion two at 20, uh, 14 weeks of gestation with history of recurrent mid trimester pregnancy losses most probably due to cervical insufficiency. Okay, Dr. Sunaina, as you said, two things in your uh, diagnosis. One is RPL and second is cervical insufficiency. So let's start with RPL. Why do you say that this is a case of RPL? How do you define it? Um, uh, recurrent pregnancy loss is defined as two or more failed clinical pregnancies, either documented by histopathology or by ultrasound. Uh, and therefore it excludes any biochemical or molar pregnancies or ectopic pregnancies. So that is by which definition? You are showing us three definitions, ESHRAE, RCOG, ASRM guidelines. So what are you telling? Which guidelines do you say? Um, this is uh, ASHRAE guidelines of 2017. As well as ASRM. I think both of them say yes, really the same it. thing. Yes. But RCOG says loss of more than three. So do you think they are uh, losing some cases which could have been rectified? Because they are they say three and you do not investigate at two, or you think the patients uh, according to the guidelines being screened by ESHRAE and AS ASRM are they being over investigated? Um, actually, ma'am, ASHRAE uh, excludes any biochemical pregnancies, but uh, RCOG includes these pregnancies, biochemical pregnancies. So the uh, population they are targeting is ultimately the same. So basically, they are trying to maintain the balance by including the biochemical pregnancies when they talk about three. And mm -hmm. when they talk about two, they, do, they exclude ectopic, they exclude molar, and they exclude biochemical. biochemical pregnancies. So we have to keep in mind which criteria, which guidelines we are using. And this balance is just so that we do not over-investigate a patient, and we also do not lose those patients in which they, we would have found a rectifiable cause. So, okay, moving on to the second thing in your diagnosis, you said it is cervical insufficiency. Yes, ma'am. So what are the points in the favor of your this diagnosis in your history? Why do you say this case is of cervical insufficiency? Uh, ma'am, in my patient, uh, both of the abortions were beyond the uh, 16 weeks period of gestation and they occurred at uh, uh, earlier gestations from the prior loss. Then there was no history of any uh, uterine contractions, according to patient. It was painless uh, dilatation. There was no previous history of any leaking in the patient. So that's why uh, I made a diagnosis. Basically, the painless mid trimester loss. Yes. So is it primary RPL or secondary RPL? And what does these two mean? Ma'am, uh, my patient is a case of primary RPL. Uh, so primary RPL is defined as multiple losses in our women with no previous viable birth. Whereas secondary RPL is uh, multiple losses in a woman with previous history of uh, a viable birth. And what can be the causes of it? Mainly, let's talk about, talk about primary RPL as this is your case. Uh, yes, ma'am. So, ma'am, uh, since my patient is a case of primary RPL, so the causes of cervical insufficiency can be congenital or acquired. Uh, congenital uh, causes can be associated with the uh, Mullerian anomalies such as septate or uniconvert uterus. Uh, it can be also associated with in utero exposure of diethyl stilbestrol. Uh, there can be familiar ten tendencies as well. Uh, it can be associated with connective tissue disorders such as Marfan syndrome. Uh, acquired causes can be uh, a history of uh, any cervical lacerations or tear during the vaginal deliveries or uh, cesarean section. That won't be in the primary? That won't be in primary RPL. So what can be primary. the acquired causes in the primary RPL? Uh, Ma'am, any previous uh, history of cervical intervention such as electrosurgical excision or conization or uh, laser ablation for the gill surgery. Okay, so now moving forward with it, we have a diagnosis with us. Now the patient has come to you at 14 weeks. What will you like to do? She has just come to you in the antenatal OPD and she has just one ultrasound done at uh, whatever it was, seven six, weeks. seven weeks. Yes, ma'am. So now what will you like to do? Uh, I have taken a detailed history of my patient. Uh, so first of all, uh, I will explain the patient that is uh, that uh, there is still high risk. Uh, she's a high risk patient for uh, mid trimester loss and preterm birth. How much uh, is the risk? What will? How much is the risk? What will you like to tell her about the risk? Uh, um, she is uh, from yes, two losses before. So yes. what do you think? Um, around uh, 
24 21 to 24% chances that she will have a recurrent uh, pregnancy loss in her next pregnancy so how does this risk goes on increasing with each pregnancy uh yes ma'am the risk increases with each uh, pregnancy uh if if there is uh, one pregnancy loss uh, in the previous pregnancy then the associated risk is around 10 to 14% with more than two pregnancy losses the risk is 21 to 24% and if there are more than equal to three pregnancy losses then the risk increases up to 30 30% so first thing you have done you have told the patient that she is a high risk patient now and it, what the next you would like to do with the patient uh, ma'am since my patient is at is at 14 weeks period of gestation so i will advise her vaginal progesterones uh, to support her pregnancy uh, then i will offer her a serial cervical length measurement beginning from 14 weeks only up till 24 weeks period of gestation so at a what will you of- advise her today we will talk about the future when she comes at after two weeks or after one week what will you advise her today will you uh, get an no, ultrasound done her- first in your yes, uh, department will you first let uh, get an ultrasound done yes ma'am i will advise okay, her okay so you got an ultrasound done and you find that uh, she is having 23 mm of cervical length now uh, ma'am uh, i will uh, follow up her weekly uh for cervical length measurement she is having 23 uh, sorry ma'am 23 uh, 23 mm of edge uh, 23 mm is a cervical length so i will offer her a, a cervical prophylactic cervical since her uh, uh, cervical length is less than 25 mm how will you proceed with that uh so ma'am first of all i will take a consent from the patient and explain her that this is only a supportive surgery and cannot guarantee uh, continuation of the pregnancy i will explain her the risk associated with the uh, surgery and uh, uh then for the procedure i will ask the pa- uh, i will ask the patient to get an ultrasound done which uh, which she already has for fetal viability uh i would like to get some uh, investigations so uh, like tls uh, total leukocyte count high vaginal swab and uh, urine culture to ex- uh, to exclude any infections uh then i will ask the patient ma'am shall i go on to explain the procedure as well yeah please okay um pre op ot procedure and the post op plus i would like to know the advice on discharge okay uh so ma'am uh, my patient uh, since it is a prophylactic circlage so the patient will lay in a uh, dorsal lithotomy position and uh, after uh, cleaning and draping cleaning is done only with normal saline and not with betadine solution since it's in a, it's an irritant so after cleaning and draping uh the anterior and posterior vaginal wall are retracted uh, with uh, with the anterior vaginal wall retractor and some speculum the anterior lip of cervix will be held by a uh, sponge holding forceps or alice uh then i would uh, i would like to offer a mcdonald circlage uh, which is uh, uh with a non absorbable suture i will place uh, uh, going from uh, beginning from the anterior lip of cervix i'll go in a purse string manner as high as possible at the cervical vaginal junction uh and uh, close the cervix uh, cervix in a posterior manner uh, keeping the knot anteriorly okay now ma'am uh, now i will advise uh, the patient of, uh, to continue uh, vaginal progesterone what can be the risk with this uh ma'am the risk can be you will have to tell the patient the risk associated no yes ma'am uh so the uh, risk associated with cervical circlage is uh, that there can be hydrogenic hydro- rupture of uh, cervical membranes there can be risk of infections tear uh, a cervical tear or lacerations she can also uh, land up in preterm labor uh, and there can be associated bleeding with this uh, the late complications can be uh, cervical tear lacerations if the stitch is not removed and she ends up in labor then there is uh, there are chances of uterine rupture uh, then she can go into preterm labor uh, and uh, there is uh, there are chances of cervical dystocia and uh, cervical scarring so these all the risk you are supposed to tell pre op when you are taking the consent from the patient yes now you have operated your patient you have put the circlage now when you are discharging the patient what advice will you give uh ma'am i will give uh, i will continue the progesterone supplementation to the patient i will ask her i will explain what is the preferred that... progesterone according to the guidelines uh, what is the route preferred vaginal progesterone is preferred for short cervical length um then i will explain the patient that uh, red flags uh, such as she can uh, she has to report to the emergency if she has any uh, leaking bleeding uh, or uh, contractions uh, i will continue her iron and calcium supplementation and uh, uh, i will also ask her to avoid uh, coitus don't you like to continue folic acid also 
Uh, yes, ma'am. And uh, you won't advise her to come for a routine follow-up visit? Yes, ma'am. She should come for routine follow-up uh, visit after two weeks. After two weeks. Okay. Now, supposing this patient, instead of having less, uh, that is, uh, we discussed about 23 mm, she shows it to be uh, 27 mm. When she okay. came to you at 14 weeks in the antenatal OPD, you did an ultrasound. And when you did an ultrasound in the TBS, one was this case which we discussed that she had 23 mm. So you put an encirclage. Yes. That was less than 24. 25 mm. Okay. So now if it is 27 mm, yes. now what will you like to advise? Uh, Ma'am, I will continue with uh, serial cervical length monitoring, but I will call her at weekly intervals. Uh, also, I will continue her progesterone supplementation. I will ask her to continue iron, calcium, and folic acid. And I think explain. you'll be starting the progesterone supplementation as this is the first visit to you. And first time you are seeing that, uh, so the progesterone has not been started yet. Yes, uh, yes ma'am. I'll start yeah. progesterone supplementation. So you will January. be starting the progesterone. Yes, ma'am. So you'll be starting the progesterone. You are advising her iron, calcium, folic acid. And I will explain and her red flags, uh, such as she has to report to emergency if she experiences uh, uterine contractions, uh, any leaking or bleeding per vagina. Okay, so uh, and uh, she will come after how much time to you? Mom, I will follow, follow up visit. Her, follow up every week, weekly interval. Every week with a repeat ultrasound. Scan. Repeat ultrasound for cervical length measurement. For cervical length. Okay, and if she is, if in this fourteen weeks ultrasound there's a third patient who shows thirty mm, yes. then what will be your advice? Uh, Mom, I will give her the same advice, except I will follow this patient every two weeks. Okay. Now, supposing this patient whom you have called after two weeks, she comes to you in the emergency, as you had explained her the red flag signs. So she has a bag of membranes bulging and she is having labor pains and she turns to you in the gynae emergency. Now, what will you do? <coughs> instead of coming after two weeks, that is she is at 14 weeks. Instead of coming at 16 weeks, she turns up to you at 15 weeks with uh, you see a bag of membranes bulging and uh, she's having pains. What will you like to do now? Um, I'm, I will explain her uh, uh, the high risk associated with the condition uh, that she uh, might go into preterm labor or uh, uh, not preterm labor, but uh, mid trimester loss. And I will offer her uh, emergency circlage or rescue circlage um, after uh, ruling out any bleeding, uterine contractions uh, and infection. How we proceed with that? So in the earlier case, the patient just came for the routine antenatal visit and you found and you did a circlage. Yes, that sir. was what you did. Electively, you posted her for the circlage because you found in the ultrasound report that she was having less cervical length and as she is a case of previous two uh, mid-trimester losses. Mid losses. Okay. So, ma'am, uh, this was one... the other two patients which you were following her up, but one of them turns up for the rescue and circlage. Yes, ma'am. Now explain that. Now, how will you deal with this patient? Uh, since uh, she's an emergency case and she's already going into mid uh, cervical uh, dilatation, so there's a possibility that her uh, me fetal membranes uh, are prolapsing through the internal os. Uh, in such case, uh, I will uh, try to deposit her uh, uh, fetal membranes back, which uh, with the following options. She can be laid in steep Trendelenburg position uh, or uh, we can fill her bladder with 600 to 800 ml of uh, saline. Uh, we can also deposit the fetal membranes uh, by a moist swab or we can uh, insert a Foley's catheter gently into the cervix and inflate its balloon with 20 to 30 ml of normal saline. Uh, then uh, I will uh, uh, use a non-absorbable suture and uh, pass it from uh, anterior to uh, in a mattress suit, uh, mattress formation, uh, inserting from 12 o'clock position and uh, going out uh, from uh, to the six o'clock position and then another suture, mattress suture from nine o'clock to three o'clock position. I will take these uh, two sutures and uh, tie the knot. I will also explain the patient uh, that this is only a supportive therapy and uh, um, can you just tell us two, three points? How will you try to manage with those bulging membranes? Uh, yes, ma'am. First of all, I can lay her in steep Trendelenburg position or overfill the bladder with 600 to 800 ml of sal uh, saline. This will push the membranes in the Kefalad uh, manner. 
then I can also gently reposit the uh, membranes with moist swab uh, and uh, keep them away from my field of uh, surgery. Then I can also use a Foley catheter and insert it through the cervix. I will inflate its bulb with 20 to 30 ml of sal uh, saline. And while I'm tying the knot, I will deflate it and uh, take the Foley catheter out. Then, there, uh, then while taking the suture, I can also uh, pull the lip of cervix in towards me so that it's out, uh, away from the fetal membranes. Okay, this is a rescue suture, no? Dr. Sunaina, can you please tell what are the ind elective indications? What are the history? What do you understand by history based or uh, ultrasound based encephalage? Yes. Yeah, uh, I will be coming to that. Okay. I'm just coming to that after some time. <coughs> okay. okay. Uh, so we have dealt with the two cases. Yes. Okay. Now there's a third patient which we were talking about yes, who sir. had more than 30 mm at 40 weeks, 14 weeks, and we were following her up. So okay. she comes at 16 weeks. Her cervical length is okay. You ask her to come after again two weeks. You are continuing the same treatment, continuing a progesterone, iron, calcium, folic acid. And every visit, you are reinforcing the warning signs to her. Yes, ma'am. Okay. 16, 18, 20, 22. Now, instead of coming at 24, she comes to you at 25 weeks. Okay, ma'am. Now, she comes with an ultrasound report showing the cervical length to be 23 mm. Okay, uh, so, ma'am, uh, since uh, her uh, cervical length is less than 25 millimeters, so I will offer her uh, prophylactic circlage. She's 25 weeks now. Achha, she's then how many weeks do you want to offer the encircolage? Uh, ma'am, uh, cervical circlage is offered till uh, 24 weeks period of gestation. Exactly. So that is what I wanted to stress here. You have to see what is period of gestation. Period of gestation. You have to see whether it is you need a rescue or an elective. So that is a slightly different procedure of doing it. Yes. Okay. So you counsel her counsel. and you will continue, ask her to continue the same treatment, yes. but there is no need to put a circlage. You're not going to put after 24 weeks. Okay. okay. Yes. So, okay. There was a patient whom you had done the circlage at the first visit at the 14 weeks. Okay. You had one patient. 14 weeks, pe hi jab thi, to aapne uska kar tha, uska 23 mm thi. Yes, now let's start with that patient. She is also following your, you up. And now she comes at 31 weeks with preterm labor pains. Now what you will do? Okay, I'm saying 31 weeks period of gestation. Yes, uh, so ma'am, my patient is now 31 weeks period of gestation and she has come to me with preterm labor pains. Uh, so first of all, uh, I will uh, remove her uh, uh, cervical stitch. Uh, then I will counsel the patient uh, regarding preterm labor and the risk associated to the baby. So I will consult a pediatrician and take a reference from the pediatrician as well. Uh, then I will start her on antibiotics. I will uh, start her with the corticosteroids, uh, co corticosteroid cover for fetal lung maturation. And for uh, fetal neuroprotection, I will offer her magnesium sulfate. Uh, I, will do, I will do fetal monitoring and... Uh, monitor uh, the uh, progression of labor. Do you like to give a tocolysis for the 48 hours you're giving steroids? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, just for the period of steroid cover, I can offer her tocolysis as well. So you are giving her, you're continuing with progesterone? Uh, no, ma'am. She's already in labor. Now. So you want to stop it? Yes, ma'am. I think there is no harm in continuing it. Okay. 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 So you have removed the circlage, which can really cause harm. Yes, the other things, iron, calcium, progesterone, steroids, tocolysis, neuroprotection, all has been done. Yes. Okay. Supposing yes. instead of 31 weeks, she comes at 35 weeks. Okay. The same lady with the circlage put at 14 weeks. Instead of coming at 31 weeks, she has come at 35 weeks period of gestation with preterm labor. Now also, will your treatment re remain the same or there is a change? Uh, so my, my patient is in late preterm labor. Uh, so uh, I will uh, get the same pediatrician reference, explain her the risk associated to the baby and uh, remove the circlage. Uh, but this time I will not offer her any uh, magnesium sulfate for neuroprotection, will not uh, give any tocolysis. 
but I would like to give corticosteroid cover because 34 to 36 period of gestation is a controversial period, but uh, I would like to give since she has two previous losses. You can continue at 34 or till 36 weeks, progesterone. Yes, Okay. Uh, and continue progesterone, yes, ma'am. Okay, so she neither comes at 31, neither comes at 35, she comes at 37, 38 weeks. Now, will you like to remove her circular? She's not having labor pains, nothing. So, when will you electively like to remove her circular? Uh, ma'am, uh, cervical circular can be removed at 36 weeks period of gestation. So, supposing she comes to you at 37 weeks and you have removed her circular, okay. Uh, Yes, ma'am. I will remove her circlage at 37 she came weeks. at 37 weeks. You removed her circlage, but she did not go into labor till two, three weeks. Uh, okay. Uh, and she, her pregnancy continued till 40 weeks and she delivered at 14 week, 40 weeks period of gestation, a healthy baby. Yes, ma'am. Okay. But after three weeks, there was another patient with cervical circlage she delivered within two to three days after removal of circulars. That is at 37 weeks, you removed it and she delivered in two to three days. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, both these patients, <clears throat> what will you advise on discharge? Uh, ma'am, so There will be a common advice. So you can give me a common advice. What will you advise to both these patients? Circulars was removed at 37 weeks. One delivered at 40 weeks and the other one delivered within two to three days. So common advice to both these two patients. Uh, Ma'am, firstly, I would like to offer patient uh, contraceptive. I would like to give contraceptive advice to the patient uh, that uh, there should be uh, at least uh, three to five years of gap between her uh, two pregnancies. Then uh, I would like uh, to counsel the patient regarding her next pregnancy that uh, since she had a successful outcome with cervical circlage in this uh, pregnancy, so she uh, should also elect for cervical circlage, elective cerv uh, cervical circlage in her next pregnancy. Mm. Anything else you would like to advise her? Uh, Ma'am, I will continue her uh, iron and calcium folic acid, uh, iron calcium tablets. Anything so, else? Um, Excuse me, breastfeeding, iron calcium um, has to be continued plus early ANC check booking in the next early pregnancy. ANC in the next, uh, yes, ma'am. So in the next pregnancy, after three years, both these patients come. Yes, ma'am. So what will you like to do? Seven, eight weeks they have come. Now what will you advise? Seven weeks they come for a dating scan. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes. Investigations. Now what will you advise them? Uh, ma'am, I will advise, uh, uh, I will uh, start folic acid tablets if she has not already started taking uh, that. Then uh, I will counsel the patient regarding her uh, previous pregnancies and the risk associated uh, with cervical insufficiency. Uh, she had a previous successful outcome with cervical circlage. So I will advise her to come at 14 weeks period of gestation, between 12 to 14 weeks period of gestation, and uh, will uh, post her for elective cerv uh, cervical circlage. The patients want to know that has the risk decreased as now they have a full term delivery. Both these patients had a full-term delivery. Now they are having one baby, a healthy baby. So have their risk of having pregnancy loss in this pregnancy decreased? No, ma'am. No. So the risk remains the same. It does not preclude uh, whether she has a uh, full-term pregnancy. So now, will you like to do cervical circulage in both these patients at 12 to 14 weeks? One delivered after three weeks of removal of circlage and the other delivered within two to three days. Uh, yes, there a difference? Uh, yes, ma'am. I will offer both of them uh, cervical circlage as 12 to 14 weeks. See, ACOG says that if the patient delivers after two weeks of removing the cervical circlage at 37 weeks, okay. then you can follow this patient with ultrasound in a similar manner. Yes, ma'am as you did with this patient in her first year uh, after the two abortions. Okay. The other patient who delivered within two weeks, that patients need to be given a profile okay. and that will be history-based circulage. Okay. So now just elaborate on it. What do you mean by a history-based circulage and what do you mean by a ultrasound-based circulage? What uh, are these two terminologies? 
so ma'am history based circulage is uh, when there is uh, more than equal, uh, more than equal to one mid trimester loss or uh, uh, extreme preterm births uh, preterm births before 34 weeks period of gestation or she had a previous successful outcome uh, with the uh, cervical circulage in previous pregnancy this is history based circulage and ultrasound based circulage is uh, when uh, in, a, with, in a singleton pregnancy when she had a previous history of mid trimester loss or preterm birth uh, along with this she had sh uh, short cervical length of less than 25 mm uh, between 24 uh, between 14 to 24 weeks period of gestation so one is ultrasound based one is obstetric based Yes, so now just can you sum up what are the indications of circulage yes ma'am uh, so ma'am uh, uh, circulage is only done uh, as of now for singleton pregnancies uh, so it can be history based uh, with history that you have already told yes ma'am and uh, physical examination that was really... elective and That's history elective. based history based and elective the yeah. other you have said ultrasound based again and elective elective uh, then there, there is physical examination based which is usually a rescue circulage when they uh, uh, and it's done between uh, 14 to 28 weeks period of gestation when the cervix is dilated and effaced uh, and uh, may uh, and the uh, fetal membranes may be bulging through the cervical os uh, and patient has uh, weak irregular contractions uh, which are uh, not uh, able to explain the cervical dilatation and uh, effacement of the patient then we will offer her physical examination based rescue circulage so basically one was emergency that was a rescue circulage and the two were elective one was history based which you are doing at 12 to 14 weeks yes and the other is ultrasound based which you are doing only till 24 weeks 24. and not after that yes until 34 to maximum 36 weeks we are continuing with the progesterone yes. rest are routine anc investigations a rest antenatal advice of iron calcium folic acid yes. remains the same the additional is that at every visit yes, you are supposed to stress upon the patient about the warning signs you have to explain her that she is a high risk patient yes okay okay ma'am and uh, steroids also we are giving till 34 weeks and uh, also the tocolytics are given only to cover the steroids steroids yes. so i think that's all dr tanu taru if you want to ask something So that was a good presentation. Yeah, thank you. Very well discussed. Very well discussed and well answered. Thank you. Now, uh, can we move on to the next case, Dr. Nitika? Please share your slides. So I'll I'll just stop, stop sharing. sharing. Yeah. Now there's a question in the chat box. Can we give vaginal progesterone in spite uh, in spite of uh, doing cervical encephalage? Ah uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am. Uh, if we have done cervical encephalage then uh, vaginal progesterone is continued till 34 to 36 weeks beginning can from can progesterone replace encephalage uh no ma'am uh, vaginal progesterone uh, do not uh, replace uh cervicalage so if the cervical length is less than 25 mm encephalage is advised it is it is to be offered uh, good evening everyone i am dr nitika a pg resident from esi basai darapur Uh, presenting the second case on recurrent pregnancy loss my Dr. Patient... taru there is another question in uh, question answer box a patient with recurrent pregnancy loss with positive anti cardiolipin antibody uh, dr shivani that will be discussed in the second case okay okay this is the okay. second case okay uh, my patient mrs x 30 year old female move your slides slides are not moving Ma'am, yeah. is it moving? Ah, yes, My sir. patient, Mrs. X, thirty-year-old female, married to Mr. Y, resident of Dwarka, a housewife belonging to lower middle class, by modified Kupuswami sc score, is gravida three, para one, live one, abortion one, at ten weeks three days period of gestation, presented in gynae OPD with complaints of uh, pain abdomen with spotting per vaginum since one day. History of present illness. She presented in the OPD on second February two thousand twenty-two with complaints of two months amenorrhea associated with pain lower abdomen with spotting per vaginum since one day. There is no history of fall, trauma, coitus, or heavy weight lifting. There is no history of passage of clots. No history of burning micturition or increased frequency of micturition. No history of galactorrhea, headache, or blurring of vision. No history of acne or hirsutism. No history suggestive of any thrombotic events in the past. 
no history suggestive of diabetes or thyroid disorder. First trimester, it was a spontaneous conception confirmed by urine pregnancy test after one week of her missed period. Patient was taking folic acid tablets regularly, no history of excessive nausea or vomiting, no history of fever with or without rash, no history of urinary tract infection, no history of any other drug intake except for folic acid or radiation exposure. There was a history of spotting per vaginum at two and a half months of amenorrhea. There is no history of trauma, no history of recent coitus. Obstetric history, she is married for four years, non-consanguineous marriage. Her first pregnancy was four months after marriage in 2018. It was a spontaneous conception, resulted in a preterm vaginal delivery at 33 weeks of gestation in view of severe preeclampsia with fetal growth restriction. Her postpartum period was uneventful. Her female child is three years old, alive and healthy and immunized till date. She used barrier contraceptives in between her pregnancy. Her first abortion was spontaneous conception in 2020. UPT was confirmed after 10 days overdue. Spontaneous, uh, spontaneous bleeding occurs at two months of amenorrhea and ultrasound was suggestive of uh, missed abortion at seven weeks and medical abortion was done. This is her, uh, her present pregnancy is her third pregnancy. Menstrual history, her last menstrual period was 22nd November 2021, making her EDD to, ED to be 29 August 2022. Her cycles were regular every 25 to 31 days, lasting for four to five days, normal flow, no dysmenorrhea or passage of clots. Past history, no history of diabetes, hypertension, renal disease, autoimmune disease, thyroid disorders, or no history suggestive of any venous or arterial thrombus in the past. No history of chronic medical or surgical illness in the past. Personal history, she has normal bowel bladder habit, normal sleep pattern, no history of uh, coffee intake, BD, alcohol, or recreational drug intake in or any other addictions. Uh, she, she consumes mixed diet, by 24-hour recall method, the calorie intake is 2200 kilocalories and protein intake is 60 grams, which is adequate as per her requirement. Partner history, her husband is 30-year-old, a government employee, non-smoker, non-alcoholic, no tobacco chewing, no history of any chronic medical or surgical illness. Family history, there is no significant family history of any chronic medical or surgical illness. No history of congenital malformations in the family. Drug history, she is not on any regular medication and she is not allergic to any drug. General physical examination, uh, uh, she is alert, conscious, cooperative. Height is 155 centimeters, weight is 54 kgs, making her BMI 22.5 kg per meter square, afebrile to touch, well hydrated. Her pulse rate is 88 beats per minute, regular, good volume, no radio radial or radio femoral delay. Her blood pressure was 118 by 76 millimeters of mercury in right arm sitting position. Respiratory rate was 14 per minute. There was no pallor, cyanosis, clubbing, ictus, lymphadenopathy, or edema. No enlarged neck glands or no engorged neck veins. Breast examination. Breasts are enlarged, areolized, prominent, and dark. Visible veins are seen on the surface. No discharge seen. Respiratory system examination. Bilateral chest air entry was present and equal on both the sides. No adventitious sound were heard. Cardiovascular examination. S1 and S2 are audible and no murmur are present. Uh, CNS examination, gait was normal. No gross neurological deficit was there. Abdominal examination, inspection, normal. All quadrants moving equally with respiration. No scar mark, dilated veins or mass visible. Umbilicus central, inverted. And all hernial sites free on cuff impulse. On palpation, the temperature is not raised no mass or lump felt or no organomegaly. Gynecological examination on local examination, vulva appears normal. Per speculum examination, cervix uh, os was closed and mild bleeding was present. 
per vaginal examination uterus was retroverted eight week size freely mobile non tender and bilateral fornix were free and non tender and gloved finger slightly stained with blood her investigation her all anc investigations were done and were found to be within normal limit ultrasound tvs was done on 24 january 2022 which uh, suggestive of single intrauterine g sac with fetal pole but cardiac activity was not appreciated and crown rump length was 9 mm on 2nd uh, february 2020 22 repeat scan was done suggestive of single intrauterine g sac with fetal pole but no cardiac activity crl was 10 m 10 mm so my provisional diagnosis is 27 year old uh, female gravida 3 para 1 live 1 abortion 1 at 10 weeks 3 days of period of gestation with missed abortion so dr nitika what do you think the cause responsible for this loss also in this particular patient she had mm -hmm. one preterm delivery in view of severe preeclampsia with fgr and the second was missed abortion now now this pregnancy also you showed that ultrasound was suggestive of missed abortion uh, ma'am in this case uh, there could be two possibilities whether it could be because of genetic abnormalities or it could be because of immunological causes because there is a history of pre uh, eclampsia severe preeclampsia in previous pregnancy so it could be because of anti phospholipid antibody uh, presence so she could have recurrent abortions this time also she is having a missed abortion so how would you rule out the genetic cause what uh, ma'am what should you do whether you would advise paternal karyotype or you would advise the product of conception karyotype uh -huh. genetic evaluation yes ma'am Ma'am, there are various options for analysis of uh, product of conception. We can use conventional. Ma'am, you would you should say I will analyze the product of conception. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Now you tell. Ah, uh, ma'am, product of conception will be analyzed because there are already ah uh, two abortions are there. So we we will and genetic testing will be done. So there are various options. We can use conventional G banding karyotype, or we can use twenty four chromosome microarray analysis. fluorescence in in situ hybridization and nuclear sequencing can also be used What but preferably we are using advantage and disadvantage of all the four uh, ma'am advantage of uh, uh, ma'am in conventional g banding it is a uh, more affordable patient cannot afford a uh, 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 such a costly test like a micro array so we micro can micro array also cost around 8000 yes ma'am so they also cost around 6000 not a big difference okay Uh, but ma'am there is a, a, a disadvantage of a uh, karyotyping as it requires cell culture so it takes longer time to give the report and also there are chances of maternal cell contamination so it does not it, uh, there are chances of giving false positive report in case of karyotyping very good and okay. ma'am uh, uh and fl uh, uh, fluorescence in situ hybridization there is a, a disadvantage that it only uh, Uh, it only uh, is done for some chromosomes not for all chromosomes because it has only probes for some chromosomes only which chromosomes ma'am uh, it could be uh, to uh, detect any uh, numerical uh, abnormalities like chromosome 13 chromosome 21 so it is for some specific chromosomes so only which we use which we probes. use five probes 8 13, 13 21 x and y these are five oligonucleotides which are fluorescent labeled okay in karyotyping the conventional karyotyping it is done a matter phase study it needs culture it needs four weeks at least four weeks you said culture failure is common then maternal cell contamination is common and it is time consuming low resolution now what about cma chromosomal microarray principle is dna based it does not require culture yes batao uske bare mein Uh, ma'am in uh, comparative genomic hybridization in this uh, uh, the test dna is extracted and it is amplified with the normal reference dna and they are labeled with different colors and the ratio of uh, different colors are used to analyze the copy number of each chromosome so okay. it analyzes all the chromosomes uh, matlab all autosomes along with x and y chromosome yeah and what is the limitation can you tell the limitation which will be covered by the nuclear sequencing or a whole exome sequencing 
Yes, ma'am. Uh, comparative uh, genomic hybridization generally cannot detect balanced rearrangement and also low level of mosaicism cannot be detected by them. And also minor copy of uh, numerical defect could not be uh, uh, identified by CGH. So for that, we can use nuclear sequencing. So uh, the limitation is that it cannot detect single nucleotide variants and very small insertions or deletions. So for that, the whole exome sequencing is a very good option because it studies the whole genome. Okay, so now I'll tell the recommendations of different guidelines regarding uh, genetic evaluation of product of conception. Yes, ma'am. RCUG 2011 recommends that after three or more subsequent abortions, the product of conception should be studied for genetic analysis. ASRM, it does not recommend... Uh, uh, it is 2012, uh, no? Now it, has, it is also updated. Okay. Yes, ma'am. And also in ASHRAE 2017, condi conditional recommendations are there only for explanatory purposes. But if we are doing a, a genetic analysis for product of conception, ASHRAE tells that we should use CGH for genetic analysis. So the present day recommendation is that after two or more or losses, more losses, we have to advise the chromosomal microarray analysis on the product of conception. And the result could be either euploid it could be a nucleoid or it could be structural abnormalities. So discuss this chart. Yes, ma'am. In genetic analysis, uh, if we get a euploid fetus, then we should screen for other treatable causes for uh, recurrent pregnancy loss. If we are getting any chromosomal abnormalities, it could be because of monosomy or any other aneuploidies. So it could be either a chance, a chance event that by chance it is a sporadic uh, chance that patient have a genetic abnormality. So there are no increased chances of recurrence. But if there is uh, one more factor, if the age of the patient, maternal age is more if it is more than 40 years then chances of recurrence are increased and also if there is unbalanced chromosomal uh, translocation then parents should be screened because they could be the carrier of bar balanced translocation so karyotyping for both the parents is recommended so if this result is aneuploid most of the times these are sporadic events yes. but they are also associated with increasing maternal age or they could be because of the non-disjunction it could be because of the parental chromosomal anomaly. In that particular case, definitely parental karyotype is advised. The indication of parental karyotype is, is if you find unbalanced mm -hmm. chromosomal translocation in the product of conception, because in that particular case, both the parents or either of the parent is a carrier of balanced balance. translocation, reciprocal or a Robertsonian translocation or insert in this inversion. So the resultant uh, result is that a product of conception has unbalanced translocation, which is incompatible with life. Or if the pay, there is a previous history of congenital malformation in the previous baby, then it is an indication of parental karyotype. So what are the guidelines about the different uh, parental karyotypes? Ma'am, for parental karyotyping, RCOG does not recommend uh, parental uh, uh, so none of the guidelines basically at the day today recommend. recommend parental karyotype as a first line investigation. So it is basically if there's a genetic history of uh, affected congenital anomaly in the previous child, or there's a evidence of balanced translocation in family or in the product of conception, then only we have to go for a parental karyotype. Yes. Okay. Now, suppose in this patient on evaluation, the study shows a normal report. Now, the se your second uh, provisional diagnosis was regarding auto uh, case uh, indication, no? Yes, ma'am. So how will you evaluate this patient regarding uh, antiphospholipid antibody? As yes, ma'am. Ma'am, immunological causes could be autoimmune or alloimmune. Autoimmune mainly consists of antiphospholipid syndrome. That is an acquired thrombophilia. And antiphospholipid uh, syndrome could be primary if it is only associated with antiphospholipid antibody positivity, or it could be a secondary APS if it is associated with other autoimmune disorders like SLE or rheumatoid arthritis. And APLA can lead to 5 to 10 percent of recurrent pr pregnancy losses, and it is usually causing pregnancy losses after 10 weeks of period of gestation. What is a beautiful condition that it is treatable because yes. if you diagnose this and you treat it, the pre pre uh, successful live birth rate is in the tune of 70%. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So what is the diagnostic criteria for EPLA? 
Uh, Ma'am, uh, for antiphospholipid syndrome, the diagnostic criteria we are using is re uh, revised Saporo's criteria. In this, there are two things, a clinical criteria and laboratory criteria. And for calling a patient to be APS positive, she should have one clinical and one lab criteria. In a clinical criteria, there should be a vascular event that is one or more episode of arterial venous or small vessel thrombosis in any tissue or obstetric uh, criteria like there is uh, one or more unexplained death of morphologically normal fetus beyond 10 weeks of gestation or three or more un, uh, unexplained consecutive spontaneous abortions before 10 weeks or there is a history of severe preeclampsia or FGR necessitizing the delivery before 34 weeks. And in the lab criteria, there is a presence of lupus anticoagulant on two occasions, 12, 12 weeks apart, or there is a medium or high serum levels of IgG or IgM of anti-cardiolipin antibody on two occasions, 12 weeks apart, or there is a presence of anti-beta-2 glycoprotein on two occasions, 12 weeks apart. So we are taking you one know, clinical and one lab criteria to diagnose a patient. How do you assess patient. these antibodies? Uh, Ma'am, for so said the, at least 12 weeks and why high levels? What is the rationale behind all this? Uh, Ma'am, uh, generally lupus anticoagulants are the mainly antibodies which are directed against the plasma proteins and phospholipids. And they are mainly uh, assessed by the uh, diluted Russell Viper Venom test. In this, we are adding a uh, patient's plasma. We are adding a Russell Viper, which activates factor okay. 10 and it enhances the uh, uh, clotting but in cases of anti-lupus anticoagulant is present so it delays the clotting and but after adding an uh, extra amount of plasma the uh, clotting uh, get fastened so if this happens then lupus anticoagulant is said to be uh, present in the patient's oh, no, no, the principle is wrong wrong see that um, uh, this anti-cardiolipin and anti-beta-2 glycoprotein are assessed by elisa because anticoagulant basically activity is tested with a phospholipid dependent clotting assay these tests are either aptt or kaolin core okay. clotting okay. time or okay. dilute russell viper venom and uh, these are the tests yes, basically isme kya hota ki, these tests the clotting is prolonged and it, even the prolongation is not corrected when the patient plasma is mixed with the normal healthy plasma. It will be correct when it platelet because plasma does not have phospholipid. Because that is why it is said platelet phospholipid neutralization. Yes, it will be corrected. So in that condition, uh, it, this is to assess the lupus anticoagulant. Now you said it is 12 weeks. Why? Because the transient increase can be in other small infections, malignant infections or acute febrile illness. So it is persistent. Yes, so initially to 1996, it was, uh, criteria was given, but it was not written 12 weeks. But afterwards it was revised and then it was persistent. At least at 12 weeks, it should be present and it should be in the medium to high titers. Okay? Yes, because uh, mild elevations, they are not specific and yes. neither they are associated with thrombosis. Okay, this is about the antibodies. Huh. Now tell about the complications other than RPL. Ma'am, other than recurrent pregnancy loss, it can lead to preterm labor, preterm rupture of membrane, fetal growth restriction, preeclampsia, eclampsia, placental abruptions. Okay, so now if the, if this is positive on two occasions, 12 weeks apart. Now, how will you manage and how will you counsel the patient? She's in the interpregnancy period, she's keen for pregnancy. So what all advice will you give to this patient? Ma'am, for this patient, we will uh, generally uh, uh, explain her about the okay, condition. Also, counsel her. Na, uske baaki koi address ho, usko psychological. Kuch aur bhi yes, batao. Ye seedhe treatment pe kabi nahi jao na. Yes, Pahle batao usko aap kya batayenge ab usko. Ma'am, uh, ma'am, we will inform the patient about her condition and also tell the uh, that it is a treatable cause. Tender love and care is very important in recurrent pregnancy loss patients. Psychological support should be given to the patient and also she should be explained about the negative effects of alcohol, smoking and lifestyle modification should be advised to the patient. Also preconceptional tablet, uh, folic acid to be given and also role of vitamin D supplementation is to, is to be done for the patient. Okay. And now coming to the this particular condition, Apla, what advice will you give? 
Ma'am, in APLA, uh, there are uh, depending upon the patient's history. If the patient is antiphospholipid antibody positive and there is a history of recurrent pregnancy lo loss, then according to ASHRAE, pre pregnancy, uh, preconceptional aspirin is to be given for this patient and uh, low molecular weight heparin to be started as soon as the patient is uh, UPT positive and this to be continued six weeks postpartum. Okay. And uh, if the patient is having APS positivity with prior venous or arterial thrombosis, then aspirin, a low dose aspirin is to be given along with intermediate or therapeutic dose of low molecular weight heparin and is to be and heparin is to be given six weeks postpartum. So listen, this patient, you said if there is a history of previous venous or arterial thrombosis, and she must be on a long term anticoagulation. वो तो होगी ना एंटीकोगुलेशन पे वार्फेरिन पे होगी किसी पे भी होगी ऐसे तो नहीं होगा ना शी इज़ ऑन तो आपको उसको फिर आपको वार्फेरिन किसी पे स्विच करना यू द पेशेंट इज़ प्लानिंग फॉर कंसेप्शन यू हैव टू स्विच ऑन टू लो मॉलिक्युलर वेट हिपरेन बिफोर कंसेप्शन बिफोर कंसेप्शन है ना और डेफिनेटली बिफोर स Yes, ma'am. Not till six weeks. Like she will be on a lifelong anticoagulation because there's a history of thrombosis. Okay. And if the if there is a presence of antibodies, but there is no history of thrombosis, no history of any obstetrical complication. Complications. Then we can no. offer a low dose aspirin or no. Why? Treatment. Why are you advising low dose aspirin? Ma'am, to in order to prevent, uh, she can uh, have the propensity yes. to develop preeclampsia okay. in this pregnancy. She's a high risk patient for development of preeclampsia, so you will advise low dose aspirin. But in this particular case, you will start aspirin at twelve weeks, yes. definitely before sixteen weeks, so yes, as to prevent the development of early onset yes. preeclampsia. That is, which will develop before thirty four weeks, which has adverse effects. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So, है ना? And um, that's all, na? Okay. So in this patient, you will start aspirin, seventy-five milligram once a day. Once a day. Low molecular weight. In this particular your case, prophylactic yes, days of low molecular weight heparin. But heparin is to be started. Yeah. So what are the advanced? What are the different types of heparin? You know, low molecular weight or unfractionated heparin. How do you give? What are the adverse effects? Ma'am, uh, we use uh, generally uh, two types of heparin: unfractionated heparin and low molecular weight heparin. Unfractionated heparin is uh, generally uh, having uh, more side effect as it leads to heparin-induced thrombocytopenia and osteopenia, but its half life is uh, shorter, so can be uh, uh, so it's okay. better during the later uh, 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 time of pregnancies. We can switch LMWH to uh, heparin, but LMWH having a, a lesser side effect as compared to heparin, so can be used. And also, LMWH cannot be used in a, a, a renal patients, but unfractionated heparin can be uh, used in a patient having any renal disorders. Okay. And uh, heparin are mainly given as prophylactic dose and therapeutic dose. The prophylactic dose for unfractionated heparin is fine, divided. Fine, fine, fine. So number one, heparin does not cross placenta. It is yes, safe, you yeah, know. So आपको low molecular weight heparin is preferred because it needs single dosing. It is associated with less osteopenia and less platelet uh, high thrombocytopenia. You yeah, know. The advantage with unfractionated heparin is that it is short acting. You can easily control it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, है ना normally हम low molecular weight heparin पे रखते हैं and when do we when do we stop low molecular weight heparin? Ma'am, low molecular weight heparin can be stopped uh, before uh, twelve weeks. If it is on prophylactic dose, then we can stop it twelve weeks before induction or cesarean. But if it is given twelve क्या बोल रहे हो? Twelve hours, ma'am. Twelve hours of induction of labor or uh, cesarean section. Or if it is given in therapeutic dose, then we can stop it a twenty-four to thirty-six hours before induction or a cesarean section. So prophylactically, minimum twelve hours, and therapeutically, it should be stopped twenty-four hours. Twenty-four. And when can you restart this? Because and if we are need... given prophylactic dose, we can uh, restart it after six to eight hours of delivery. And if we are giving it in therapeutic dose, we can start it after twenty-four hours of uh, delivery. What is the antidote of heparin? Ma'am, antidote of heparin is a uh, protamin injection. Protamin sulfate, one milligram of protamin sulfate neutralizes hundred unit of unfractionated heparin. Okay, okay, fine. चलो, the patient has delivered. हम्म, आपको postpartum भी आपने शुरू कर दिया इसको. 
Now, what about the family planning advice will you give to this particular patient? Ma'am, for family planning advice, uh, we can offer her contraceptives, but we should never offer them contraceptive containing estrogen because they are thrombogenic. So we can offer them uh, uh, injection uh, DMPA and also we can offer them uh, intrauterine devices like a copper IUCD and uh, a progesterone only pills can also be offered to such patients. So, very uh, take home messages estrogen containing contraceptive should not be given to anti phospholipid patients. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, what are the indications when you can use uh, advice for screening for inherited thrombophilias? Can you tell something about it? Yes, ma'am. Uh, inherited thrombophilias, generally it is not recommended to screen for inherited thrombophilias, but if there is any history that patient is having any thrombotic event in the past or uh, any other history, then a history in the family of thrombotic disorders, then we can screen the patient for thrombophilias and uh, thrombophilias, uh, the most common thrombophilias which could be found. Are normally, normally, we do not recommend screening for inherited thrombophilias. The only indications are if there's a history of known thrombophilia in inherited mm -hmm. thrombophilia in the fam per, patient, uh, fam patient's family or if uh, there's a history of unprovoked thrombosis or thromboembolism, particularly in less than 50 years. Right? Mm -hmm. Unprovoked means that there was surgery or immobilization. Mm -hmm. hua, hi ho gaya, hai na? Unprovoked uh, thrombosis. Hua, usme, there is an indication. You can go ahead. But definitely, it is presently in, in the present time, it is a research investigation. Yes, okay. So now we have discussed about uh, genetic causes, about antiphospholipid. Can you tell us something about the alloimmune causes of uh, RPL? Uh, yes, ma'am. Alloimmune causes are generally when allo antibodies are produced, matlab, maternal antibodies are produced, which leads to recurrent pregnancy loss. It could be mainly maternal production of cytotoxic antibodies, or there is absence of maternal blocking antibodies, disturbance in natural killer cell functions. So all these antibodies will act at a fetal maternal interface and leads to a fetal uh, recurrent pregnancy losses. Uh -huh, Evidence does not recommend routine recommend screening, screening for any uterine natural killer cells or HLA or any of these uh, causes to in, in evaluation of recurrent pregnancy losses. Yes, ma'am. Suppose the report of this patient was um, APLA negative and the TSH was around 3.8 or 4. What would you do for this patient? Uh, Ma'am, uh, 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 endocrine disorders also lead to um, uh, recurrent pregnancy losses. Mainly, this patient is having TSH more than 3.3, so she is having hypothyroidism. So we can offer her treatment for uh, hypothyroidism. And also, according to ASHRAE, for a patient with recurrent pregnancy loss, uh, there should be a thyroid screening uh, along with TSH and anti-TPO antibody should also be screened for such patients. Okay. So in this case, uh, in this case, she is having 3.3. So we can screen for anti-TPO antibody and treatment should be started for, uh, with levothy uh, levothyroxine. Huh. And if TPO is positive, then? Then also patient should be started on the treatment. If uh, she is less... Uh, huh? If it is TPO negative. Then, and then also we may consider uh, giving her the treatment, but if it is between 2.5 to 4 and TPO negative, then it is not necessary to give her what, treatment. Yeah, we were discussing about 3.3, no? Yes, ma'am. But negative, there's, there's no need. No need to if it is positive, then it is an indication to start levothyroxine as well. Yes, ma'am. So now, uh, one more point I would like to emphasize that in a patient of recurrent pregnancy loss, there is no indication of torch investigation. Yes, See, the students, they should know that torch can cause a sporadic loss, but never will cause recurrent causes. So this is a very important thing. The student should never say this thing, ki hum a torch profile karayenge. Oh, it becomes a very blundered sort of thing. Hai, Dr. Kavita? Dr. Kavita, are you there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ah, would you like to ask something? No, I think that was quite a good presentation. Well covered. We can take the questions. Uh, there are some questions. Uh, a patient with RPL with positive anti-cardiolipin antibody now for frozen embryo transfer. When to start lonopin? In a diagnosed case of antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, APLA syndrome, the aspirin is to be started preconceptionally. And the heparin is to be started once the pregnancy test is positive or a cardiac activity has been demonstrated. 
then the this has to be continued till 30 um, till uh, 36 37 weeks there are two school of thoughts that in patients who had early losses only early losses then you can continue till 36 or 37 and stop in a patient if there's a history of loss at a later gestation then definitely it is to be continued till term and followed by postpartum anticoagulation i think nitika and sunana can try answering yes uh, if the cervical length is less than 25 at 14 weeks and priming and with no signs of pain, how to follow? Less than 25 at 14 weeks. Uh, Ma'am, ideally a cervical length measurement is not advised at 14 weeks measurement, uh, at 14 weeks period of gestation if there is no history of previous pregnancy losses. Uh, if in this patient there is previous history of uh, pregnancy, mid trimester losses or preterm deliveries, uh, then I can offer her uh, cervical circlage, but patient should be well counsel counseled uh, that uh, she can land up in preterm labor before 28 weeks period of gestation. So if there is only recurrent pregnancy loss, you are giving progesterone, you are not doing your circlage. If there is an incidental finding of cervical length, which is less than 25 mm, but there is no history of any pregnancy loss, no history of any conization, or nothing of that sort. So again, only progesterone. It's only that both the things are present. That is with RPL, you have cervical length less. When you are following the patients with cervical length, then only you do cervicalage. Okay. So we have to stress on that. So now that earlier concept, ki cervical length come to cardia, even if it is incidental finding, it's not there. Mm. Uh, so it is is in pregnancy with biconvent uterus and normal cervical length is circlage advised again the uh, same thing it is the same thing that indications of circlage i think you can just tell indications of circlage once again and then we move on to the next uh yes ma'am uh, so in biconvent uterus uh Circlage just is tell not the indications of circlage. I think that is the question which is coming okay. again and again. If there are uh, more than one pre uh, previous pregnancy, mid trimester pregnancy loss, or uh, previous preterm deliveries uh, before 34 weeks period of gestation associated with short cervical length, uh, or may not be associated with short cervical length, is history based uh, indication of cervical circlage, or uh, she has a previous successful outcome with a cervical circlage in situ, uh, is another obstetric history based uh, indication. In a patient uh, between twenty four, uh, between fourteen to twenty four weeks, uh, twenty eight uh, weeks period of gestation, and she has cervical dilatation or effacement, not explainable by uh, vague uterine contractions, uh, and there is no associated leaking or bleeding, then we can offer her rescue circlage. Uh, in a patient with the singleton pregnancy with previous history of mid trimester loss or uh, uh, preterm deliveries before thirty four weeks period of gestation with short cervical length between 24 to 20, uh, between 14 to 24 weeks period of gestation with cervical length less than 25 mm. In these patients, we will offer uh, cervical circlage. Okay, so when is lab test for RPL prescribed after delivery? Or it can be done even during pregnancy in first trimester. So we are testing, if the patient just fits into the category of RPL, we are doing testing. So evaluation is done after two losses. Yeah. Yeah, if she fits into the definition of RPL. Yeah. Can you please repeat treatment of APLA? I think they want to know about aspirin and heparin. If the patient is APLA positive, when to start and when to stop. So, Nithika, can you just repeat that? Or yeah. you can show that no, I think uh, this, uh, presentation, this presentation is live on Facebook, so they can see it's no need repeating the okay. things again. Okay, 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 okay. That's good. So uh, please tell levothyroxine advice at what TSH level? Nitika? Ma'am, uh, according to national guidelines, uh, we can, uh, uh, levothyroxine is given according to uh, trimester wise. If the value is between 2.5 to 10 and if in the first trimester, and if it is between three to 10 in the second and third trimester, 20, if, and there is no history of hypothyroidism preconceptionally, so we can give 25 microgram of levothyroxine to the patient. And in case if the value is more than 10 uh, milli units per liter, then we can uh, start the patient with 50, uh, 50 micrograms of levothyroxine. And if we are giving 25 micrograms of levothyroxine, then it should not be uh, continued in postpartum period and patient should follow up with the TSH report after six weeks. And so if we are giving 50, then it should same dose to be continued in the postpartum period for six weeks. 
please explain again the limitations. So it's uh, again on your Facebook, so you can go there. And uh, I think that's- There is another question. Uh, can a person with recurrent pregnancy loss be tested for APLA in between pregnancies? Yes, yes, yes. Ideally, it should be the patient should be evaluated in between pregnancy. And the, to diagnose it, it needs two reports 12 weeks apart. It is just when the patient turns up to you. Then you get a chance to investigate her. In which medium to send RPOC for karyotype analysis? Normally, we send in normal saline, but there is a media also, special media, but normal saline is fair enough. Okay, I think rest has all been discussed and can be seen in the recording. Yeah. Dr. Ajla, ma'am. Uh, yes. Mithika and Sunanda really need to be congratulated and as well as their moderators, Taru and Kavita, done a really good job, you know. Thank and you. and uh, very thorough presentation. It is very a very good good initiative on your part, ma'am. It is a very good academic forum. So students, they are really liking and they are keen to hear very, <laughs> it is a very good thing. Yeah, but they need to be guided unless they're guided properly, yeah. which is your job, which you people are doing so well, that uh, that is why it is becoming popular. Otherwise, there's no point, you know, they talk anything and go away. That is not the purpose, you know. And we don't have any flurry speeches and anything. We just, uh, you know, uh, come with the, this thing only, what we have come to do, you know. So that is also another initiative. Thank you, Taru. Thank you, Kavita. Thank, Thank you, Shivani. I think I must uh, give credit to Shivani. She was the one who had started on a small scale in her own hospital. And when she told me, I said, no, no, we'll take it to a bigger scale. And, you know, now where it is. Thank you, ma'am. Thank Thanks, you. Dr. Achila, for uh, such a nice coordinated mm -hmm. presentation by everybody. And it is no, possible sir. only with your big support. No, no, it's all of us and together. Yeah. <laughs> Our idea, so which Shani and myself are executing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, when Sunita is there at the head, you know, one thing is there, things will be very systematic. Mm -hmm. We've and always seen her like that, you know. It is really beneficial for the PGs. We can see the number, it was maximum going by 270. Yeah, no, I mean, no, we it's uh, uh, logging now when we are uh, chatting. <laughs> and we also thank uh, Jackson Pal. Uh, yeah. for uh, giving us this nice platform and uh, I will announce the next class. It is on 21st March. It is on endometriosis by the postgraduates of uh, Hamdard Institute of uh, Medical Sciences along with All India Institute. Ma'am, there is a small video. Everybody would be... Introducing, for the first time in India, micronized didrogesterone, Divatron, for a safer and smoother journey to motherhood. Jugson Pal Pharmaceuticals is manufacturing all the active pharmaceutical ingredients and intermediates concerning didrogesterone, making India self-reliant. Atmanirbhar Bharat. Vocal for local, go for Divatron. So apart from Divatron, Didrogestron, Micronized uh, 10 mg tablets, uh, we also have Lycorid Prex sachet of L-Arginine, Lycopene and DHA. Apart from maintained injections, 250 and 500 mg of Hydroxyprogesterone Caproid and Endoreg, our Dynogest 2 mg tablets. Thank you so very much. And we hope to see you again and again every day. So tomorrow we have another uh, program. Zoom ID is mentioned over here. Do register now uh, by just noting down this Zoom ID. Thank you so very much to AOGD and Dr. Achla Batra, ma'am, Dr. Sunita Malik, ma'am, and Dr. Shivani Agarwal, ma'am, for having us uh, every month to join you. Thank you. Thank you, Sunita and Kavita. It was very well done and uh, nicely presented. And the, all, both the postgraduates were very good. Thanks to everybody. And it's good night. Thank you, ma'am. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night.